Good morning, Living Rock Church. So excited that you could join us for this Sunday's worship. This week, we're going to be talking about the things that God is going to do. We're going to be singing about it. We're going to be um, talking about the things that we believe. So excited to be joined by Dana this week. Um, let's worship together. And come, let us worship our King. And come, let us bow at His feet. And he has done great. says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. For there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear and there is only one foundation we believe we believe in this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see that there is only one salvation. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. Let our faith be more than anthems Make it greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe We believe church. I'll start today with a story. There was a boy who had a birthday and he opened his birthday present. And when he opened the present, it was way better than anything he had imagined. And he stopped and he looked down and he looked sad. And his mother said to him, what's wrong, son? Why are you so sad? Are you sick? And he said, I don't believe it. I don't deserve it. How much do I owe you? Now that's not a very good response to a great gift, is it? Well, we've been in the book of Hebrews for several weeks. And today, the author is done wrapping the gospel gifts. 
And he wants us to open us. And he wants us to respond to the better things God has done through Christ. How will these Hebrews respond? How will we, we respond to the gospel? Some of them rejoiced at God's good gifts. And others were like this boy. I don't believe it. I don't deserve it. How much is this going to cost me? Well, some of the Hebrews responded in faith, and some of them responded in unbelief and fear. So the scripture today is Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25, and the title is, A Better Response to the Better Gifts in Jesus. But first, let me stop and review where we've been in Hebrews. The first 10 chapters of Hebrews explain over and over again in a lengthy argument why Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the angels. He's a better messenger and prophet. He's better than Moses. He's the better high priest. He's the better sacrifice bringing the better covenant, the new covenant. So chapters 1 to 10 are very intense, very repetitious. It can be hard to read through all of it at one time. But now we get to Hebrews 10, verse 18. And this is the climax. This is the end. This is the summary statement of the past 10 chapters. It simply says, And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. There it is. Christ brings forgiveness. Sacrifices over. That's the summary statement of the first 10 chapters of Hebrews. And then beginning in chapter 10, verse 19, to the end of Hebrews, the author challenges them, challenges us to make a better response. Better gifts call us to a better response. Now let's remember what it's like to be a Hebrew at this time. Hebrews is written to these religious Jews who are devoted to God through their religious system. It's likely that many of them are still going to the temple in Jerusalem. They may still be preparing to make sacrifices for their sin in the ceremonies there. But now they're hearing about the gospel. They're hearing about Jesus, the promised Messiah. And Hebrews lays out this strong, compelling argument that Jesus is better than the old religious system because he's the fulfillment of everything that's promised there. The old system is obsolete now. The new covenant has come. Christ is the way into the house of God now and the only way for total forgiveness. So Hebrews 10, 19 to 25 tells these Hebrews, tells us exactly how we should respond to Jesus. These seven verses are actually one long sentence in the Greek, and they have three main verbs, and they all begin with let us in English. So the outline today is simple. First, let us go to God in faith. Second, let us hold on to hope. And third, let us think of one another in love. In three words, we should respond to Jesus in faith, hope, and love. So let's look at point one. Let us go to God in faith. Hebrews 10, 19 to 21 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So the first way we should respond to Christ's better gifts is with faith. The whole point of faith is to bring us to God. What other reason is there to have faith? And we come to God not because of anything we have done, 
but because of what Christ has done. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Saving faith is the only thing that pleases God, and it's the only thing that can bring us to God. Faith opens up God's house of grace and the rewards of being in his presence. Now, this idea of going boldly and entering into God's presence would have been a shock to those raised in Judaism. For them, no one ever entered into God's presence except the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He's the only one who could go behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies. God's presence was blocked with curtains. Curtains to the Holy of Holies. Curtains into the Holy Place. And back in the time of Moses, curtains around the whole tabernacle and you were curtains if you tried to go past these curtains without authorization <laughs> so this would have been a shock to hear verse 21 let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him wow see fear had kept the Jewish people out of God's presence for centuries but now, faith in Christ alone invited them to go boldly in. And why does faith in Christ let us go into God's presence? Verse 20 says, His death opened the curtain into God's presence. Verse 21 says, Jesus is the great high priest who rules over the house of God. And verse 22 says, Our guilty consciences have been sprinkled clean with Christ's blood. That means when we're saved by faith in Christ, we stand before God forgiven and holy. Amazing. So what is faith? Saving faith is trusting in Christ alone for eternal life. And eternal life is what the Bible describes as knowing God personally and enjoying his presence now and eternally. There was a missionary named John Patton, and he went to an island in the South Pacific to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Some words you can imagine were easy to translate, but other words from the Bible were very difficult to translate. Well, John could not find a word for saving faith. He, he was stuck. And, and how can you translate the Bible without the word faith and get the message across? Well, one day a man came to work for him. He did some heavy work outside the house. And at break time, he came into the house and he flopped down on a big chair. And the missionary said, wait, what, what do you call what you just did? And he said, what? What do you mean? What did I just do? Well, you flopped down on that chair and you rested. What is the word for that? And he gave him a word. And that's the word he used in translating the word faith into their language. Saving faith is like flopping down on Jesus. It's like resting completely on his finished work on the cross for you. Faith lets us flop down and rest in the house of God's grace, in God's presence. The second response to Christ's better gift is hope. Let us hold on to hope. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Here's the second response after faith, and that's hope. And that means we hold on to the gospel tightly without wavering. We hold fast to our confession in spite of our changing moods and in spite of the changing culture. We must hold on to the things we know to be true, especially in fearful times. The gospel is our greatest treasure and never let it go. Imagine that your house is on fire and you have 30 seconds to run in and grab things that are valuable to you. What are you going to grab? I don't think you're going to go in the garage and grab your golf clubs if the baby is in the crib, are you? I hope not. 
Well, likewise, these Hebrews, some think they were living in Rome. Persecution was breaking out there. So they were in the fire of persecution. They could potentially lose everything if they left Judaism and became Christ followers. So Hebrews warns them to take hold of hope in Christ and warning them if they let go of Christ now in hard times, they have lost hope for all time. And why should we hold on to hope in difficult times? Well, verse 22 says, God can be trusted. God keeps his promise. So hold on tightly means that after you come to Christ in faith, you hold on to Christ and you never let him go and he promises to never leave you. Well, finally, let us think of one another in love. This is the third command in this passage. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. So this is the third response to Christ's better gifts. It is love. Love stirs us to action. The gospel motivates us to make a loving impact on others, on our world. The gospel is for God so loved the world that he gave. And that is the same love God puts in your heart, in my heart. So don't be surprised if you find yourself these days with a deep longing to want to reach out and, and take action and help someone in some way. That should happen once you've made your commitment to follow Christ. But look careful at the command in verse 24. It says, think about people first and not about what you're going to do first. The command literally means have intelligent insight on the best way to bring out the best in others. In other words, before you run and do something, think first. And when you think, you're probably going to be praying first too. Is this really a loving thing to do? Is this the best thing to do? Is this really going to help? Because sometimes when we try to help others, it's not too intelligent. And it doesn't really help after all. Have you been there? I have. There have been times when I thought I was helping out a situation and I made it worse. So the command is stop and think. And also remember this. What motivates you may not motivate someone else. That's why we have to think about others first. What motivates them? The verb in the command let us think of ways to motivate one another points to people first and what we want them to do second. I heard a strange story about a research student. He was doing a study on flies. So he put a fly in one hand and somehow he taught it to jump into his other hand. And then he would study this and come up with a conclusion. So he said, jump to the fly, and it jumped to the other hand. Then he decided he would start pulling legs off the fly. So he pulled a leg off the fly, and he said, jump. And the fly jumped to his other hand. Then he pulled another leg off the fly, and he said, jump. And the fly jumped to the other hand. And he did this again and again and again, until finally he pulled off the last leg on the fly, and he said, jump. And the fly just sat there. So he wrapped up his research with this statement. When you pull all the legs off a fly, the fly goes deaf. <laughs> My point is this. In the church and in the home, if we don't think before we try to motivate others to action, people may stop listening to us. And we have maybe just pulled the legs off of them and removed all their motivation. Family members, co-workers, church members, they don't jump at commands or criticism. 
We motivate others best when we understand people and understand what motivates them. When you respond fully to Jesus, he gives you gifts. He gives you wings so you can share his love in ways that motivate you, and I encourage you to do that. The church isn't here to clip your wings, to shout at you, criticize you. No, we're here to encourage you to fly in the love of God. The worst advice I ever heard a church leader say was, we have to do something. No, that isn't faith. That isn't hope. That wasn't love either. It was fear. It was panic. And I can say from experience, his fearful action made things worse. What we have to do in trying times is to go to God in faith, be in his presence. We have to hold on to hope. We have to think about one another in love. And maybe we need to tune out the experts and get God's greater blessing for an even greater impact, a greater good in our world. Did you see verse 25? Especially, it says, now that the day of his return is drawing near. Jesus is coming soon. Look what's happening to our world right now. So all of our Christian activism, it must be motivated by love, by faith, and by hope. And we must govern our actions by the soon return of Christ. If we knew Christ was coming back tomorrow, what would we do today? That's a great governing thought. Well, in conclusion, verse 25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together. <laughs> Did you notice that all three responses in this passage begin with, Let us so now, how do you fully obey these commandments if we're not together as a church? I don't know. We're doing some amazing things to be together at this time, but we need to be together so that we can see the full expression of how to live in obedience to God's commands. We respond better to Jesus when we're together. A Christian without a church family is an orphan. We're like a cheeseburger without cheese. We're like a boat without a lake. We're like a hand without a body. God saves us to be in community. I am thankful I can meet with you today through this video production, but I'm praying now more than ever we can all be back together, that every church can be back together in faith, in hope, and in love. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. And I pray we would be fed today by this word. And God, you would give us a boldness to come before you today with our fear and our anxieties. And I pray everyone would sense the presence of God to calm them and strengthen them. And I pray we would hold on to hope. We would never let go of Jesus as we remember he will never let go of us. And I pray that our love would increase during this time of distance and that we, just, we would be motivated to love and serve and to be together again better than ever. Thank you for the better gospel of Christ and the better response we can give in this world because of the love of God through Jesus. Amen.
All right. Thanks, Ethan. Yep. What do we got to do here? Uh, let's see. We'll get these lights. Okay. Carrying the cross here. Yeah. Create this one chair.